Hello there. How are you? How is everyone? I hope everyone's very well. Um, it's a beautiful day here. I'm in California. I don't know where you all are. One of the miracles is that we're able to be all over the world and uh, I can read you these beautiful books in front of the fire. It's quite hot today in front of the fire, but notwithstanding, this is fireside reading, and so we need a fire. Um, I hope everybody's well. My name is Gilbert, and I started fireside reading when we all got locked in our houses. I thought of my mum, who's sadly not alive, but if she was alive, she would have been lonely, and I thought uh, there may be other people who either are lonely, want a bit of companionship, or maybe just want to be read to, because that is a sort of uh, a, a form of entertainment which I think has been a little lost, and um, I very much enjoy being read to. I was read to when I was a kid, and I enjoy reading to people. So I thought of my mom, and I thought there would be others who would appreciate this, and it seems that there are, so I'm very grateful to you all for, for getting on and listening and making this date with me every, every day, 5 p.m. Pacific time. If and when you miss a, a chapter, you can always go to the YouTube channel Fireside Reading, where I upload all the chapters, so you can get uh, them at any time that you'd like. And many people seem to list, prefer listening to it there. Um, we are currently reading The Awakening, a beautiful book written in 1899. It's considered by many to be one of the first uh, seminal books of uh, feminist American literature. Um, it really is very subtle and beautiful, and we are on chapter 16. And where we left it, Edna, who is married to Mr. Pontellier, but has been on holiday at Grand Isle, and has, it's seeming that she's fallen in love with Robert, a uh, young man, and at the end of the previous chapter, Robert announces that he's leaving, he's going to Mexico. Edna's very upset, but notwithstanding, at the end of the previous chapter, Robert leaves, and she no longer has him as her companion. That's where we are, and I want to welcome you to a fireside reading of The Awakening, chapter 16. Do you miss your friend greatly? Asked Mademoiselle Rhys one morning as she came creeping up behind Edna, who had just left her cottage on her way to the beach. She spent much of her time in the water since she had acquired, finally, the art of swimming. As their stay at Grand Isle drew near its close, she felt she could not give too much time to a diversion which afforded her the only real pleasurable moments that she knew. When Mademoiselle Rhys came and touched her upon the shoulder and spoke to her, the woman seemed to echo the thought which was ever in Edna's mind, or better, the feeling which constantly possessed her. Robert's going had some way taken the brightness, the colour, the meaning out of everything. The conditions of her life were in no way changed, but her whole existence was dulled like a faded garment which seems to be no longer worth wearing. She sought him everywhere in others whom she induced to talk about him. She went up in the mornings to Madame Lebrun's room, braving the clatter of the old sewing machine. She sat there and chatted at intervals, as Robert had done. She gazed around the room at the pictures and photographs hanging upon the wall and discovered in some corner an old family album 
which she examined with the keenest interest, appealing to Madame Lebrun for enlightenment concerning the many figures and faces which she discovered between its pages. There was a picture of Madame Lebrun with Robert as a baby seated in her lap, a round-faced infant with a fist in his mouth. The eyes alone in the baby suggested the man, and that was he also in kilts at the age of five, <laughs> wearing long curls and holding a whip in his hand. It made Edna laugh, and she laughed too at the portrait in his first long trousers, while another interested her, taken when he left for college, looking thin, long-faced, with eyes full of fire, ambition, and great intentions. But there was no recent picture, none which suggested the Robert who had gone away five days ago, leaving a void and wilderness behind him. Oh, Robert stopped having his pictures taken when he had to pay for them himself. He found wiser use for his money, he says, explained Madame Lebrun. She had a letter from him written before he left New Orleans. Edna wished to see the letter, and Madame Lebrun told her to look for it either on the table or the dresser, or perhaps it was on the mantelpiece. The letter was on the bookshelf. It possessed the greatest interest and attraction for Edna. The envelope, its size and shape, the postmark, the handwriting, she examined every detail of the outside before opening. There were only a few lines setting forth that he would leave the city that afternoon, that he had packed his trunk in good shape, that he was well, and sent her his love and begged to be affectionately remembered to all. There was no special message to Edna, except a postscript saying that if Mrs. Pontellier desired to finish the book which he had been reading to her. His mother would find it in his room, among other books there on the table. Edna experienced a pang of jealousy because he had written to his mother rather than to her. Everyone seemed to take for granted that she missed him. Even her husband, when he came down the Saturday following Robert's departure, expressed regret that he had gone. How do you get on without him, Edna? He asked. It's very dull without him, she admitted. Mr. Pontellier had seen Robert in the city, and Edna asked him a dozen questions or more. Where had they met? On Carondelet Street in the morning. They had gone in and had a drink and a cigar together. What had they talked about? chiefly about his prospects in Mexico, which Mr. Pontellier thought were promising. How did he look? How did he seem? Grave or gay or how? Quite cheerful and wholly taken up with the idea of his trip, which Mr. Pontellier found altogether natural in a young fellow about to seek fortune and adventure in a strange, queer country. Edna tapped her foot impatiently and wondered why the children persisted in playing in the sun when they might be under the trees. She went down and led them out of the sun, scolding the nurse for not being more attentive. It did not strike her as in the least grotesque that she should be making of Robert the object of conversation and leading her husband to speak of him. The sentiment which she entertained for Robert in no way resembled that which she felt for her husband, or had ever felt, or ever expected to feel. She had all her life long been accustomed to harbour thoughts and emotions which never voiced themselves. They had never taken the form of struggles. They belonged to her, and they were her own, and she entertained the conviction that she had a right to them and that they concerned no one but herself. Edna had once told Madame Ratignol that she would never sacrifice herself for her children or for anyone. 
then had followed a rather heated argument. The two women did not appear to understand each other or to be talking the same language. Edna tried to appease her friend to explain. I would give up the unessential. I would give up my money. I would give my life for my children, but I wouldn't give myself. I can't make it more clear. It's only something which I'm beginning to comprehend, which is revealing itself to me. I don't know what you would call the essential or what you mean by the unessential, said Madame Ratignol cheerfully, but a woman who would give her life for her children could do no more than that. Your Bible tells you so. I'm sure I couldn't do more than that. Oh, yes, you could, laughed Edna. She was not surprised that Mademoiselle Reese's question the morning that lady, following her to the beach, tapped her on the shoulder and asked if she did not greatly miss her young friend. Oh, good morning, Mademoiselle. Is it you? Why, of course I'm Miss Robert. Are you going down to bathe? Why should I go down to bathe at the very end of the season when I haven't been in the surf all summer? replied the woman disagreeably. I beg your pardon, offered Edna in some embarrassment, for she should have remembered that Mademoiselle Reese's avoidance of the water had furnished a theme for much pleasantry. Some among them thought it was on account of her false hair or the dread of getting the violets wet, while others attributed it to the natural aversion for water sometimes believed to accompany the artistic temperament. Mademoiselle offered Edna some chocolates in a paper bag, which she took from her pocket by way of showing that she bore no ill feeling. She habitually ate chocolates for their sustaining quality. They contained much nutriment in small compass, she said. They saved her from starvation, as Madame Lebrun's table was utterly impossible and no one save so impertinent a woman as Madame Lebrun could think of offering such food to people and requiring them to pay for it. She must feel very lonely without her son, said Edna, desiring to change the subject. Her favorite son, too. It must have been quite hard to let him go. Mademoiselle laughed maliciously. Her favorite son? Oh, dear, who could have been imposing such a tale upon you? Aileen Lebrun lives for Victor and for Victor alone. She has spoiled him into the worthless creature he is. She worships him and the ground he walks on. Robert is very well, in a way, to give up all the money he can earn to the family and keep the barest pittance for himself. Favorite son, indeed. I miss the poor fellow myself, my dear. I liked to see him and to hear him about the place, the only Lebrun who is worth a pinch of salt. He comes to see me often in the city. I like to play to him. That Victor hanging would be too good for him. It's a wonder Robert hasn't beaten him to death long ago. I thought he had great patience with his brother, offered Edna, glad to be talking about Robert no matter what was said. Ho, ho, he thrashed him well enough a, a year or two ago, said Mademoiselle. It was about a Spanish girl whom Victor considered that he had some sort of claim upon. He met Robert one day talking to the girl or walking with her or bathing with her or carrying her basket, I don't remember what, and he became so insulting and abusive that Robert gave him a thrashing on the spot that has kept him comparatively in order for a good while. It's about time he was getting another. Was her name Mariquita? asked Edna. Mariquita, yes, that was it. Mariquita, I had forgotten. Oh, she's a sly one, and a bad one, that Mariquita. 
Edna looked down at Mademoiselle Rhys and wondered how she could have listened to her venom so long. For some reason, she felt depressed, almost unhappy. She had not intended to go into the water, but she donned her bathing suit and left Mademoiselle alone, seated under the shade of the children's tent. The water was growing cooler as the season advanced. Edna plunged and swam about with an abandon that thrilled and invigorated her. She remained a long time in the water, half hoping that Mademoiselle Rhys would not wait for her. But Mademoiselle waited. She was very amiable during the walk back and raved much over Edna's appearance in her bathing suit. She talked about music. She hoped that Edna would go to see her in the city and wrote her address with the stub of a pencil on a piece of card which she found in her pocket. When do you leave? asked Edna. Next Monday. And you? The following week, answered Edna, adding, it has been a pleasant summer, hasn't it, Mademoiselle? Well, agreed Mademoiselle Rhys with a shrug, rather pleasant, if it hadn't been for the mosquitoes and the Farival twins. Chapter 17 The Pontellier possessed a very charming home on Esplanade Street in New Orleans. It was a large double cottage with a broad front veranda whose round, fluted columns supported the sloping roof. The house was painted a dazzling white. The outside shutters, or jalousie, were green. In the yard, which was kept scrupulously neat, were flowers and plants of every description which flourishes in South Louisiana. Within doors, the appointments were perfect after the conventional type. The softest carpets and rugs covered the floors. Rich and tasteful draperies hung at doors and windows. There were paintings selected with judgment and discrimination upon the walls. The cut glass, the silver, the heavy damask, which daily appeared upon the table, were the envy of many women whose husbands were less generous than Mr. Pontellier. Mr. Pontellier was very fond of walking about his house, examining its various appointments and details to see that nothing was amiss. He greatly valued his possessions, chiefly because they were his, and derived genuine pleasure from contemplating a painting, a statuette, a rare lace curtain, no matter what, after he had bought it and placed it among his household goods. On Tuesday afternoons, Tuesday being Mrs. Pontellier's reception day, there was a constant stream of callers, women who came in carriages or in the streetcars or walked when the air was soft and distance permitted. A boy in dress coat and bearing a diminutive silver tray for the reception of cards admitted them. A maid in white fluted cap offered the callers liqueur, coffee or chocolate as they might deserve, as they might desire. Mrs. Pontellier, attired in a handsome reception gown, remained in the drawing room the entire afternoon receiving her visitors. Men sometimes called in the evening with their wives. This had been the program which Mrs. Pontellier had religiously followed since her marriage six years before. Certain evenings during the week she and her husband attended the opera or sometimes the play. Mr. Pontellier left his house in the mornings between nine and ten o'clock and rarely returned before half past six or seven in the evening, dinner being served at half past seven. He and his wife seated themselves at table one Tuesday evening, a few weeks after their return from Grand Isle. They were alone together. The boys were being put to bed. The patter of their bare escaping feet could be heard occasionally, as well as the pursuing voice of the nurse, lifted in mild protest and entreaty. Mrs. Pontellier did not wear her usual Tuesday reception gown. She was in ordinary house dress. 
Mr Pontellier, who was observant about such things, noticed it as he served the soup and handed it to the boy in waiting. Tired out, Edna? Whom did you have? Many callers? He asked. He tasted his soup and began to season it with pepper, salt, vinegar, mustard, everything within reach. There were a good many, replied Edna, who was eating her soup with evident satisfaction. I found their cards when I got home. I was out. Out, exclaimed her husband with something like genuine consternation in his voice as he laid down the vinegar cruet and looked at her through his glasses. Why, what could have taken you out on Tuesday? What did you have to do? Nothing. I simply felt like going out and I went out. Well... I hope you left some suitable excuse, said her husband, somewhat appeased, as he added a dash of cayenne pepper to the soup. No, I left no excuse. I told Joe to say I was out. That was all. Why, my dear, I should think you'd understand by this time that people don't do such things. We've got to observe les convenances if we ever expect to get on and keep up with the procession. If you felt that you had to leave the home this afternoon, you should have left some suitable explanation for your absence. This soup is really impossible. It's strange that that woman hasn't learned yet to make a decent soup. Any free lunch stand in town serves a better one. Was Mrs. Belthrop here? Bring the tray with the cards, Joe. I don't remember who was here. The boy retired and returned after a moment, bringing the tiny silver tray, which was covered with ladies' visiting cards. He handed it to Mrs. Pontellier. Give it to Mr. Pontellier, she said. Joe offered the tray to Mr. Pontellier, and removed the soup. Mr. Pontellier scanned the names of his wife's callers, reading some of them aloud with comments as he read. The Mrs. Delicida says, uh, I worked a big deal in futures for their father this morning. Nice girls, it's time they were getting married. Mrs. Belthrop. I tell you what it is, Edna, you can't afford to snub Mrs. Belthrop. Why, Belthrop could buy and sell us ten times over. His business is worth a good round sum to me. You'd better write her a note. Mrs. James Highcamp. You. The less you have to do with Mrs. Highcamp, the better. Madame La Force came all the way from Carrollton, too, poor old soul. Miss Wiggs, Mrs. Eleanor Bala Boltons, he pushed the cards aside. Mercy, exclaimed Edna, who had been fuming. Why are you taking the thing so seriously and making such a fuss over it? I'm not making any fuss over it, but it's just such seeming trifles that we've got to take seriously. Such things count. The fish was scorched. Mr. Pontellier would not touch it. Edna said she did not mind a little scorched taste. The roast was in some way not to his fancy, and he did not like the manner in which the vegetables were served. It seems to me, he said, we spend money enough in this house to, procl to procure at least one meal a day which a man could eat and retain his self-respect. You used to think the cook was a treasure, returned Edna indifferently. Perhaps she was when she first came, but cooks are only human. They need looking after like any other class of persons that you employ. Suppose I didn't look after the clerks in my office, just let them run things their own way. They'd soon make a nice mess of me and my business. Where are you going? 
asked Edna, seeing that her husband arose from table without having eaten a morsel except a taste of the highly seasoned soup. I'm going to get my dinner at the club. Good night. He went into the hall, took his hat and stick from the stand and left the house. She was somewhat familiar with such scenes. They had often made her very unhappy. On a few previous occasions, she had been completely deprived of any desire to finish her dinner. Sometimes she had gone into the kitchen to administer a tardy rebuke to the cook. Once she went to her room and studied the cookbook during an entire evening, finally writing out a menu for the week, which left her harassed with a feeling that after all she had accomplished no good that was worth the name. But that evening, Edna finished her dinner alone with forced deliberation. Her face was flushed and her eyes flamed with some inward fire that lighted them. After finishing her dinner, she went to her room, having instructed the boy to tell any other callers that she was indisposed. It was a large, beautiful room, rich and picturesque in the soft, dim light which the maid had turned low. She went and stood at an open window and looked out upon the deep tangle of the garden below. All the mystery and witchery of the night seemed to have gathered there amid the perfumes and the dusky and tortuous outlines of flowers and foliage. She was seeking herself and finding herself in just such sweet half-darkness which met her moods. But the voices were not soothing that came to her from the darkness and the sky above and the stars. They jeered and sounded mournful notes without promise, devoid even of hope. She turned back into the room and began to walk to and fro down its whole length without stopping, without resting. She carried in her hands a thin handkerchief which she tore into ribbons, rolled into a ball and flung from her. Once she stopped and, taking off her wedding ring, flung it upon the carpet. When she saw it lying there, she stamped her heel upon it, striving to crush it. But her small boot heel did not make an indenture, not a mark upon the little glittering circlet. In a sweeping passion, she seized a glass vase from the table and flung it upon the tiles of the hearth. She wanted to destroy something. The crash and clatter were what she wanted to hear. A maid, alarmed at the din of breaking glass, entered the room to discover what was the matter. A vase fell upon the hearth, said Edna. Never mind, leave it till morning. Oh, you might get some of the glass in your feet, ma'am, insisted the young woman, picking up bits of the broken vase that were scattered upon the carpet. And here's your ring, ma'am, under the chair. Edna held out her hand and, taking the ring, slipped it upon her finger. Chapter 18 the following morning, Mr. Pontellier, upon leaving for his office, asked Edna if she would not meet him in town in order to look at some new fixtures for the library. I hardly think we need new fixtures, Léonce. Don't let us get anything new. You are too extravagant. I don't believe you ever think of saving or putting by. The way to become rich is to make money, my dear Edna, not to save it, he said. He regretted that she did not feel inclined to go with him and select new fixtures. He kissed her goodbye and told her she was not looking well and must take care of herself. She was unusually pale and very quiet. She stood on the front veranda as he quitted the house and absently picked a few sprays of jessamine that grew up a trellis nearby. She inhaled the odour of the blossoms and thrust them into the bosom of her white morning gown. The boys were dragging along the banquette, a small express wagon, which they had filled with blocks and sticks, 
The nurse was following them with little quick steps, having assumed a fictitious animation and alacrity for the occasion. A fruit vendor was crying his wares in the street. Edna looked straight before her with a self-absorbed expression upon her face. She felt no interest in anything about her. The street, the children, the fruit vendor, the flowers growing there under her eyes were all part and parcel of an alien world which had suddenly become antagonistic. She went back into the house. She had thought of speaking to the cook concerning her blunders of the previous night, but Mr. Pontellier had saved her that disagreeable mission for which she was so poorly fitted. Mr. Pontellier's arguments were usually convincing with those whom he employed. He left home feeling quite sure that he and Edna would sit down that evening and possibly a few subsequent evenings to a dinner deserving of the name. Edna spent an hour or two in looking over some of her old sketches. She could see their shortcomings and defects which were glaring in her eyes. She tried to work a little, but found she was not in the humour. Finally, she gathered together a few of the sketches, those which she considered the least discreditable, and she carried them with her when, a little later, she dressed and left the house. She looked handsome and distinguished in her street gown. The tan of the seashore had left her face, and her forehead was smooth, white, and polished beneath her heavy yellow-brown hair. There were a few freckles on her face and a small dark mole near the upper lip and one on the temple half hidden in her hair. As Edna walked along the street, she was thinking of Robert. She was still under the spell of her infatuation. She had tried to forget him, realizing the inutility of remembering, but the thought of it was like an obsession ever pressing itself upon her. It was not that she dwelt upon details of their acquaintance or recalled in any special or peculiar way his personality. It was his being, his existence, which dominated her thought, fading sometimes as if it would melt into the mist of the forgotten, reviving again with an intensity which filled her with an incomprehensible longing. Edna was on her way to Madame Ratignolle's. Their intimacy, begun at Grand Deal, had not declined, and they had seen each other with some frequency since their return to the city. The Ratignolles lived at no great distance from Edna's home, on the corner of a side street, where Monsieur Ratignolle owned and conducted a drug store which enjoyed a steady and prosperous trade. His father had been in the business before him, and Monsieur Ratignol stood well in the community and bore an enviable reputation for integrity and clear-headedness. His family lived in commodious apartments over the store, having an entrance on the side within the porte cochere. There was something which Edna thought very French, very foreign about their whole manner of living in the large and pleasant salon which extended across the width of the house, the Ratignols entertained their friends once a fortnight with a soiree musicale, sometimes diversified by card playing. There was a friend who played upon the cello. One brought his flute and another his violin, while there were some who sang and a number who performed upon the piano with various degrees of taste and agility. The Ratignol's soiree musicale were widely known and it was considered a privilege to be invited to them. Edna found her friend engaged in assorting the clothes which had returned that morning from the laundry. She at once abandoned her occupation upon seeing Edna, who had been ushered without ceremony into her presence. Seed can do it as well as I. It is really her business. She. Seed can do it as well as I. It is really her business, she explained to Edna, who apologized for interrupting her. 
and she summoned a young woman whom she instructed in French to be very careful in checking off the list which she handed her. She told her to notice particularly if a fine linen handkerchief of Monsieur Ratignol's, which was missing last week, had been returned, and to be sure to set to one side such pieces as required mending and darning. Then, placing an arm around Edna's waist, she led her to the front of the house, to the salon, where it was cool and sweet with the odour of great roses that stood upon the hearth in jars. Madame Ratignol looked more beautiful than ever there at home, in a negligee which left her arms almost wholly bare and exposed the rich melting curves of her white throat. Perhaps I shall be able to paint your picture some day, said Edna with a smile when they were seated. She produced the roll of sketches and started to unfold them. I believe I ought to work again. I feel as if I wanted to be doing something. What do you think of them? Do you think it worthwhile to take it up again and study some more? I might study for a while with laid poor. She knew that Madame Ratignol's opinion in such a matter would be next to valueless, that she herself had not alone decided, but determined. But she sought the words of praise and encouragement that would help her to put heart into her venture. Your talent is immense, dear. Nonsense, protested Edna, well pleased. Immense, I tell you persisted Madame Ratignol, surveying the sketches one by one at close range, then holding them at arm's length, narrowing her eyes and dropping her head on one side. Surely this Bavarian peasant is worthy of framing, and this basket of apples. Never have I seen anything more lifelike. One might almost be tempted to reach out a hand and take one. Edna could not control a feeling which bordered upon complacency at her friend's praise, even realising, as she did, its true worth. She retained a few of the sketches and gave all the rest to Madame Ratignol, who appreciated the gift far beyond its value and proudly exhibited the pictures to her husband when he came up from the store a little later for his midday dinner. Mr. Ratignol was one of those men who are called the salt of the earth. His cheerfulness was unbounded, and it was matched by his goodness of heart, his broad charity and common sense. He and his wife spoke English with an accent, which was only discernible through its un-English emphasis, and a certain carefulness and deliberation. Edna's husband spoke English with no accent whatever. The Ratignols understood each other perfectly. If ever the fusion of two human beings into one has been accomplished on this sphere, it was surely in their union. As Edna seated herself at table with them, she thought, better a dinner of herbs, though it did not take her long to discover that it was no dinner of herbs, but a delicious repast, simple choice, and in every way satisfying. Monsieur Ratignol was delighted to see her, though he found her looking not so well as at Grand Isle, and he advised a tonic. He talked a good deal on various topics, a little politics, some city news and neighbourhood gossip. He spoke with an animation and earnestness that gave an exaggerated importance to every syllable he uttered. His wife was keenly interested in everything he said, laying down her fork the better to listen, chiming in, taking the words out of his mouth. Edna felt depressed rather than soothed after leaving them. The little glimpse of domestic harmony which had been offered her gave her no regret, no longing. It was not a condition of life which fitted her, and she could see in it but an appalling and hopeless ennui. She was moved by a kind of commiseration for Madame Ratignol, a pity for that colourless existence which never uplifted its possessor beyond the region of blind contentment, 
in which no moment of anguish ever visited her soul, in which she would never have the taste of life's delirium. Egna vaguely wondered what she meant by life's delirium. It had crossed her thought like some unsought, extraneous impression. Thank you all for joining me very much. I hope this helps a little, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for the next chapter of a fireside reading of The Awakening. Until then, please be very well. Good night.